Well, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight. Um, Dennis is not here. He had some, I guess, car problems or something, so we won't have a uh, bookstore tonight. So we'll make up for that next time. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at um, probably the most difficult of topics that we've looked at uh, in all these sessions, and that's cosmogony cos and cosmology. And we're going to look at this from a creation perspective. Now, <clears throat> in the first se uh, half of this series, we looked at the, the biblical model, and we kind of looked at elements from a biblical perspective, what would go into uh, a biblical empirical model uh, of cosmology and cosmogony. And so we're going to try to formulate and discuss some of those ideas from an empirical point of view, and so it should be rather fun. But hold on to your seats because some of the things we're going to be talking about um, can be rather uh, difficult to uh, capture. So tonight we're going to look at, we're going to, going to examine the difference between the terms cosmology and cosmogony. Not having a proper understanding of these two terms has caused a lot of um, confusion among the creation debate. Uh, then we're going to be looking at the, the issue that uh, makes cosmology and cosmogony important for the creation model, and that's this issue of starlight and time and the problem that this uh, generates. To further our discussion, we're going to have a simple review of our high school geometry. So you'll want to think way back into those days and try to remember your high school geometry. Then we're going to take a look at uh, some of the various creation cosmogonies that have been offered to provide empirical uh, discussion as to how God created and, uh, and that sort of thing. Then we're going to look at um, the modern models, uh, Harnett and Humphreys, although we're going to put uh, the Harnett model on hold for this evening and focus on the model of Humphreys. And then we'll have some uh, closing remarks on the nature of space and time and where do we go from here. So hold on to your seats as we talk about this most difficult subject this evening. Cosmology and cosmogony, two very important words, and they come from, or they come to us from the Greek language. The first word, of course, is the famous word everybody has probably heard, uh, heard of somewhere along the line, and that's this word, cosmos. Carl Sagan had his famous uh, PBS special, and the name of it was cosmos. But here the word cosmos actually means arrangement, and the emphasis of this word is actually the, an orderly arrangement. So it's, the emphasis of this word is on the quality of the cosmos and not the quantity. In other words, it's not, you know, today we often think of um, something as large as possible when we talk about and think about the word world, which is the word, the English word we typically used to translate cosmos. That's actually a mistake. The word itself is a qualitative word. Then uh, logos uh, means dynamic or word or message or study of. And uh, these two words make up the word cosmology, which we'll be coming to. Then the third word is ginomai or gune, and it means to become, to be born, or to be gotten. So if you take two of those three words, namely logos and ginomai, and put them together, you come up the word cosmogony, and this is how the universe originated. So cosmogony is actually the word we want to use when we're talking about the origin of the universe. Cosmology, however, is the word we want to use when we're talking about how the universe operates. Okay, And not understanding the distinction in those two terms has really caused a lot of problems. So that when <clears throat> you know, uh, astrophysicists and so on, when they talk about the origin of the universe and they talk about cosmology, it's really incorrect to use that term. They should be using cosmogony. And I can tell you tonight that it is so all-pervasive, I will definitely make the same mistake tonight. <laughs> so interpret me based on the context of the discussion. So let's take a look at this uh, problem of starlight and time. 
<clears throat> to better understand the size of the universe, we need a more convenient union of measure for such large astronomical distances. So basically what we're looking at is because the universe is so large and light travels only at a specific speed, then if the uh, object, distance of objects is larger than what you and I may expect, we might have a problem when we look at a universe that might only be 6,000 years old. So a light year is the distance that light travels in a, in, the, in a vacuum where there's no space. There's only what we call space-time. And the time that it's traveling is for one year. We call that a light year. This happens to be 5.8 trillion miles or 9.5 uh, trillion kilometers. So it's a very large distance. So if you take your flashlight and you um, <clears throat> shine it for a year, the beginning of that light beam will have traveled 5.8 trillion miles. Now a parsec uh, is another unit of measure, unit of distance uh, yeah, for that astronomers use. You might say, well, good grief, isn't a light year big enough? Well, the answer to that is no. Actually, a light year is a relatively small unit of measure when we're considering the size of the universe that we know of. So we've come up with this notion of parsec. And so what is a parsec? Well, if you take a look at that angle there, uh, you have the Earth uh, orbiting the sun. And um, uh, you have an object that you're looking at. And you want to determine how far that object is away. Well, remember from your high school geometry that if you know an angle, a side, and an angle, you can determine that triangle, right? And it's the same thing here. So you can use actually simple trigonometry to determine what that is. So what do we know here? We know that the distance between the sun and the earth is roughly 93 million miles. So that means we know this side of the triangle. We can measure this angle here. And um, so all we have to do is come up with a simple trigonometric equation and we can determine how far that object is away. So uh, one par uh, an arc second, by the way, this angle here is one arc second, and that's basically one degree divided by 60 divided by 60 again. So it's actually one degree divided by 3600, right? So that's one arc second. That's how small that angle is. So this distance happens to be 3.26 light years. So one parsec is one, uh, three and a quarter light years in distance, right? Well, that's not really big enough either. So it happens to be 19 trillion miles, but we also use uh, the kiloparsec and the megaparsec because the universe is so big, we need bigger and bigger units of measure to measure the distance of objects. Well, what, what has even furthered this problem is the Hubble telescope. And the Hubble telescope has greatly uh, expanded our understanding and view of how big the universe is. And uh, the latest figure for the diameter of the universe is 23 billion parsecs. And so here we have it here. And so this is roughly 23 billion parsecs in diameter. So if the universe is only 6,000 years old, which the biblical text clearly states if you go through the genealogy, no object greater in distance than 6,000 light years should be observable to you and us today, right? That's what the argument says. So the light time problem is precisely that. We know that there are objects greater than 6,000 light years away. We're going to be looking at one of them here shortly. And so we shouldn't be able to see these, these objects. Okay? So what you and I have to do is come up with a model that allows for objects to be larger than 6,000 light years away and for you and I to see them today. That's really the, the, the uh, object at hand for creation cosmologists. So in order to get to all this, let's take a look uh, at our geometry that we all learned back there in eighth grade or ninth grade, whenever you, you take that. 
We have to start with good old Euclid. Euclid was a, um, a Greek mathematician, and he came up with what is called Euclid's geometry, or Euclidean geometry, and he based it on various propositions, and uh, actually we're going to only be looking at one of them without actually stating which one that necessarily is, but Euclid devised a geometry where parallel lines never meet. And one of his postulates said, if the angle A and B, if they sum up to 180 degrees, then you know that line 1 and line 2 are parallel. Okay, that's one of his postulates. Another corollary to that is if you take this angle here, which is labeled A, and this angle here, which is not labeled, they're both the same angle, right? So if they are the same angle, then you know that line 1 and line 2 are parallel. It's just another way of saying the same thing. However, not everything in the world is parallel, right? We know of geometries where Euclid's postulates do not hold. In fact, we're all familiar with them. <clears throat> the Earth is one of those... Uh, geometries where parallel lines um, aren't, can't be defined like Euclid defined them. So for an example, if you look at this sphere here, and you take a look at these two lines, at the equator they're parallel. The tangent lines of these two uh, lines here are actually parallel. But as you move up the line, they cross at the top. So these two lines that are parallel down here actually cross each other at 90 degrees. The other thing about um, this sphere is that <clears throat> you have a point here and a point here, and what happens is you would think in Euclid's world, all I have to do is draw a straight line between the points, and that's the shortest distance between those two points, right? That's not true on a spherical object. There's an element called the great sphere, the great circle, and that is the shortest distance between any two points on a sphere. That's the path that airplanes generally take when they're going from, say, Pittsburgh to Beijing. They're not going to go this way. They're going to go this way because it's shorter in distance. So that's spherical geometry. The other interesting thing to note is in Euclid's world, and remember this, the angles in a triangle, they all add up to what? 180 degrees, okay? In spherical geometry, these three angles actually add up to be more than 180 degrees. So if you draw a triangle on a spherical surface, the angles add up to something more than 180 degrees. Okay, let's take a look at another one. And so this, you might, you might think, okay, where is this relevant? Well, obviously it's relevant uh, when you're trying to <clears throat> navigate on a ship, right, on the ocean. Here's another one. This might be something somewhat less familiar unless you ride horses. Uh, and this is a hyperbolic universe, not a spherical universe, but a hyperbolic universe. Uh, here we have two, two lines here. And where are they parallel? Well, they're parallel right where you sit on the horse's saddle. But as you come down from the, that point, they are no longer parallel. Okay, So parallel lines don't always meet in a hyperbolic world. Whereas in the spherical wor world, they converge to a point. In a hyperbolic world, they actually diverge. Now here's a triangle that's that you've drawn on a hyperbolic surface, and notice these little triangles here. They add up to be something less than 180 degrees. So it's kind of interesting. These different geometries that you and I actually use every day, but we don't think about it, because we were so used to thinking in terms of straight lines. But when you sit down on a horse's saddle, you're actually sitting down on a hyperbolic surface. When you're navigating the globe on your cruise ship, you're, net, you're using a different coordinate system than Euclid used. So these are kind of geometries that become useful when we talk about uh, how, the how the universe operates, when we talk about un uh, the universe bending and light rays traveling through space. We're talking about these types of geometries, not necessarily Euclid's. 
So, <clears throat> spherical geometry, uh, the coordinates are latitude. That tells you north and south, how far you go north is your latitude. Longitude is how far you've traveled toward the east. So let's take a look and see how this works. So, here we are at the equator on the left, and that is considered zero degrees. As we travel north, we go in the positive direction, and if we want to come up to roughly our latitude, which would be roughly, what, 45 degrees here in Pittsburgh? So we would be 45 degrees north of the equator. Uh, Sao Paulo is, what, roughly 30 degrees south of the equator, so that would be minus 30. So instead of having an X, Y, and Z kind of uh, coordinate system, we're operating in degrees here. So if we want to travel in a latitudinal direction, we start from the equator and go up in terms of degrees toward the North Pole, which is 90 degrees. Now, in the, um, if we want to travel east-west, we have defined the zero degree line called the meridian or the prime meridian goes through Greenwich, England. That's zero degrees. If you want to travel in the positive direction, you'll be traveling east from there. If you want to start from Greenwich and come to Pittsburgh directly, you would be traveling, whoops, you would be traveling in the negative direction. Okay, so, so these are how the lawn lat uh, coordinate systems operate. Okay, it's not an X, Y where parallel lines meet at all. Okay, so it's, you might think it's very complicated, but you can see that it's not really uh, all that conceptually difficult to see how these geometries differ, and we can use them. So why is the idea of non-Euclidean geometry important to our discussion? Here's why. When there is, because matter and space-time interfere with each other, and when they do, they create these non-Euclidean geometries. So take a look at our little, um, our math here. If you notice, this globe is sitting on this trampoline-like fabric, and as you get closer and closer to the, the ball of mass, the lines no longer are 90 degrees, okay? They start to bend, and the angles between the lines start to morph, if you will. They start to warp. That's what is called the warping of space-time. So mass actually bends space-time, and if you go away from the massive object, notice that these lines up here are in fact relatively parallel and the, the, the other coordinate system is 90 degrees apart uh, or 90 degrees uh, away. So, so when you're far away from matter in space-time, you can talk about Euclidean geometries, but when you get to massive objects, like a black hole, for example, Euclidean geometry no longer works. It becomes extremely difficult to, uh, to model things. And uh, so this is the importance of, of understanding non-Euclidean geometry. So in this case, matter tells space-time to bend, and space-time tells matter how much it is going to bend, okay, based on how stiff space-time is. So note the grid and how it changes around the massive object, as we have said. So this, this is what we mean by non-Euclidean, or um, what we'll call Riemannian geometries. Now, why is it important to know this term? Because if you read a lot of this literature, you're going to be running into this term, Riemann. And Bernard Riemann was a great mathematician in the 19th century, and he developed this notion of non-Euclidean geometry. And in fact, he formulated non-Euclidean geometry, the very geometry that Einstein used to formulate his general theory of relativity. Um, Riemann, he had his PhD advisor was Carl Gauss, uh, one of the, probably arguably the greatest mathematician in the 19th century. Uh, little Carl Frederick Gauss was a very interesting character. Uh, Bernard Riemann was an ardent student of scripture, I might add, and um, he was the founder of tensors and all sorts of other mathematical 
objects that are used in, in um, general relativity and um, differential geometry and some of these areas of physics that we really have to know to understand the details of this. And this is the problem with um, cosmology in general is uh, the mathematics that's required to really dive into this field is very intense. Not every physicist delves into this sort of thing and um, so it's a very specialized branch and um, so that's why it's a little bit difficult I think for a lot of people to um, dive into because it is so specialized. So <clears throat> we're familiar with some geometry now. Let's take a look at some of the cosmogonies, see I'm being uncareful here with my text, let's look at some of the cosmogonies that creationists have tried to offer to explain this light travel problem, okay? We're just going to take a brief, uh, brief look at them. Um, some folks have tried to examine or come up with this tired light model, and what this model says is light in the form of photons slow down as they're traveling through space. The reason they slow down is due to this idea of cosmic friction, okay? So you have this little photon, he's slowing down, getting tired. That's why he continues to yawn. <laughs> and of course, this, uh, the speed of the light then follows this decay curve, something like this, this uh, exponential curve, and it is uh, slowed down to its present day value. And um, there's a problem, I think, with this tired light model. Uh, it does, however, address the redshift problem, but that's about the only thing that it addresses. If true, then stellar objects would appear to be blurred, but they don't. So if light is, being, if light is slowing down, according to this model, you would expect to find, as you look up in the sky, things to be very blurry. But if you have 20-20 eyesight, you notice, hey, they're not so blurry, right? But um, so this, this particular model predicts that and it's not what's observed. Uh, there's no known mechanism for this and uh, it doesn't predict the observed time dilation, uh, time slowing down or speeding up kind of thing and uh, so it doesn't explain a lot of the things that we need to explain that we know to be true. And it doesn't explain the three degree background radiation that we know is out there. And this particular model has been pretty much given up by creationists uh, for a long time now. Now there's another model that's still, uh, still in vogue by a lot of folks. It's called the C-decay model. It's in type, it's similar to the tired model, tired light model, but uh, somewhat different. It was popularized by Barry Setterfield in the late 70s. Barry Setterfield is a uh, physicist out of Australia and he had written several uh, papers and a couple of books on the topic and uh, so he was the popularizer of this model. Now what Barry Setterfield did was he took all the known data that he had um, on this, of measuring the value of the speed of light and what he did was he fit curves to them to determine which curve fit the best on this data. And he started with the data that Remmer in the 1600s measured by looking at the um, moons of Jupiter. And they could, you can determine the speed of light based on the, uh, rota or the, revolu the rotation of the, um, or the revolution of the uh, moons around the planet Jupiter. And Remmer had calculated that back in the 1600s. So he used all that data from 1600 to the present and he came up with this curve that looked something like this. Now, <clears throat> uh, it, it is a cosecant squared curve as we will see. And if you notice on that curve to the right, notice how it falls off real quickly in the beginning and then slows down toward the end, right? Well, it's a cosecant squared decay curve for you buffs in trigonometry. And what's significant about this is this a cosecant squared decay curve is also very similar to um, the luminosity of stars. It has a similar kind of uh, decay curve. Uh, it's a sharp drop from the initial value, which uh, Setterfield would argue began at about 
10 orders of magnitude higher at creation than it is today. It levels out according to the data curve fitting that he did around 1967. That was the summer of love, as I understand it, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, he, the decay proposed as a function of time, so he, he, uh, he modeled this as a function of time. So as time continues on, the speed of light decays. Now what's interesting about this is if this is the case, there are other physical constants that are dependent upon the value of the speed of light. And if they're dependent on a speed of light that is decaying, then they must also change in some way to remain, for things to remain constant. So that's the argument that Setterfield was using. And so what he did was he came up with other dependencies on fundamental constants based on the speed of light decaying. So let's take a look at some of these. The electron rest mass. Well, the famous equation, E is equal to mc squared. Conservation of energy says that E must always be the same, right? But if C is decaying, that means m must increase on the order of 1 over c squared to overcome the changing in the speed of light in order to keep E constant, okay? So he argues that the rest mass of an electron uh, varies over time as a function of 1 over c squared. Planck's constant, one of the most important constants in all the universe, according to quantum mechanics, E is equal to h nu. Um, a photon has a energy that's a function of its frequency, which is this letter nu. It's the Greek letter nu. And it's proportional to the energy through Planck's constant. But in order, to, if, if you notice, the frequency is always over this, is equal to the speed divided by the wavelength, right? Well, if light travels at the speed of light c, then the frequency is equal to c over lambda, which is the wavelength. And that would mean that if c is decreasing, lambda is constant, h must be increasing by a factor of 1 over c. Okay, So that's Setterfield's argument. The gravitational conference con uh, constant. Force is equal to um, the gravitational constant times the mass of m1, the mass of m2, divided by the distance between them. Famous equation. Well, here we have masses again. Remember what we said about the rest mass of an electron. Well, each one of these guys is proportional 1 over c squared. That must mean, in order for this to remain constant, that g must be proportional to 1 over c to the fourth, if c is changing in order to keep the force the same. And then something very important here is the radioactive decay constant. It turns out that um, the decay constant lambda is proportional to C. So if C is decreasing, lambda is directly proportional to the speed of light, and therefore it must also be decreasing. The implications of that is that radioactivity, radiometric decay, occurred much faster in the past. So the Setterfield model uses this idea to say, look, we've had all this radioactive decay in the past, and we can now say that it occurred in 6,000 years because of a greater value of the radioactive decay constant in the past. Okay, So this is what his argumentation was. All right, according to some theorists, uh, the Setterfield model lacks a rigorous data analysis. Okay, so um, uh, they argue that the analysis that needs to be done needs to be done in a much more rigorous way than has been done so far by Setterfield and some of his followers. Uh, when you look at some of the equations uh, and his, his derivation of it analytically, it could very well lead to a local violation of the conservation of energy. Okay. Uh, it lacks a rigorous mechanism. 
And the implications, however, agree with other researchers from other fields. For example, the rate group, um, comprising of uh, several people from the Institute of Creation Research and some other creation organizations, what they are claiming is that the decay constant has definitely increased, uh, or I'm sorry, decreased. It was greater in the past. And they have uh, come up with some mechanisms for that. But um, they don't necessarily link it to the decay in the speed of light. They link it to other quantum mechanical elements. But it states the same thing, that the radioactivity in the past was greater than it is today. Now, it does also address the starlight and time problem and potentially the red shifting of stellar objects. We look at in the, um, the further you look in the sky, the more red shift you see. And um, Setterfield has shown that uh, if the speed of light is decaying, then this could explain the red shift we see in objects. So these are some of the things that the C decay model um, uh, has um, characteristics, and some people agree, others don't agree. Uh, I would say the majority of uh, creation researchers uh, do not agree with the CDK model any longer. Um, <clears throat> in the 70s, a couple of creationists um, started um, looking at this model that was offered by two gentlemen, Moon and Spencer, in 1953. The paper that they authored uh, was entitled Binary Stars and the Velocity of Light. And um, essentially what they were looking at was in a binary star, you usually have a more massive star in the center, and the less massive star can be viewed as rotating around the, the more massive star. And what their model seemed to uh, require uh, was something that's kind of contrary to special relativity. When the star, when you're looking at the rotating star, as when the star comes out from the massive star, it starts coming toward us, right? Well, as it's coming toward us, what they argued was that the speed that the light that we're seeing is the speed of light C plus the speed of the rotating object that's coming toward us. That's contrary to special relativity, because special relativity says no matter how fast you are going in a rocket ship and you shine your flashlight, it's always going to be traveling at C, not C plus the speed of the rocket ship. Okay? And um, so they were using um, this model to, to address this issue. Uh, requires a non-Euclidean geometric universe, which doesn't seem to be much of a problem. Its conclusion, however, was that the radius of the universe was only 15.71 light years. So it would only take roughly 16 years for light to get from the most distant object to the Earth. Okay, so this, uh, this was a model that was being offered by, um, or I shouldn't say offered, but looked into by Harold Slusher and others in the 70s. Whether he uh, still holds to this, I don't know. Um, it was, however, rebutted rather successfully, I might add, in the CRS Quarterly in 1984 by a physicist by the name of uh, Russell Ackridge in the Creation Research Society Quarterly. And um, Ackridge showed that the model required a universe that is far too dense with matter than observed. In order for the Moon-Spencer model to work, we need more matter. Okay? But we don't observe that matter. Um, he also showed that the model itself required that the universe wind down too quickly, that this universal cosmic death has to come too soon. And, uh, of course, this model contradicts special relativity, which is a very well-regarded uh, and founded theory. So the Moon-Spencer model actually never took hold within the creation model. Then we come to this appearance of age issue. Has, any, has everybody heard of the appearance of age, the appearance of age model? It's actually um, not too bad of a model. Um, it's a legitimate model, as we will see, but it has some weaknesses. Well, the argument goes something like this. God created the universe to look old or mature, okay? 
And we can examine this. Suppose you're walking in the garden, you run across Adam several days after his creation, and you ask, how old are you, Adam? He looks at himself and he says, well, looks like I'm about 25 years old. But you know that he was only created three days before, right? <laughs> so he looks mature. He doesn't look like he's three days old. So the argument of the appearance of age is that God created the universe to look mature, to operate in such a way that to the observer, it must have been operating for quite some time. Here's an example. Adam looks like he's 25, but he's only three days old. Then we come to, let's say on day 11 after creation, we come to a, an oak tree that's in the garden. We uh, wonder how, lar uh, how old this 100-foot oak tree is. So we cut a, um, take a drill and we take a slice out of it. We count the rings and uh, lo and behold, it looks like it's 60 years old. But we know that it was created just 11 days ago. Right? So, <clears throat> so the idea is that this appearance of age model really addresses the issue that God created the universe in an operational way that it appears mature. Okay? So it works for some things, but it doesn't work for everything. It actually breaks down in a very dramatic way. And let's take a look at one of those ways. How old is the Andromeda galaxy? Well, it's 2.5 million light years away, so it must be 2.5 million years old, right? The appearance of age model breaks down after 6,000 years. So when we come across a stellar object that we measure to be greater than 6,000 light years away, the appearance of age model breaks down. Now you might say, well, why does it break down? Because now it requires light to travel further than the time that exists. So it creates actually mythical events, virtual events that never really happened. And let's take a look at one of them. <clears throat> uh, here we have the Crab Nebula. I'm sure we've all seen the Crab Nebula, very famous nebula. Uh, this was created or observed to come into existence in 1054 AD, roughly 5,000 years after creation. Okay? But the distance is 6,500 light years away. So we have 1,500 years of mythical light. Okay? So this event had to occur 1,500 years before it was created. Okay, so that's the problem you run into with the appearance of age problem, uh, with the appearance of age model. So it creates these mythical events, things that don't actually happen uh, or never happened. And um, so, so the, age of the, the, the appearance of age issue only works within a very well-defined framework. Okay, it's okay to use it, but you have to make sure you, the context that you're using it is proper. So the event never really happened, which is, of course, a cons contradiction. We saw it happen a thousand years ago, almost a thousand years ago, and um, so we know it happened. All right, uh, some of the modern cosmologies, uh, one of them is the Har Harnett model. John Harnett from Australia uh, based his cosmology on a gentleman named Carvelli. And uh, we're not going to look at that tonight. Uh, it would take us far afield, I think, but it's an interesting model. And I think it is, um, it's not catching on for various reasons, but uh, it's still a very interesting model. So what we want to do for the remainder, remaining time here uh, is take a look at the Humphreys model. Has anybody ever heard of the Humphreys model or is familiar with it? Okay, uh, this, this model was created by uh, Russ Humphreys in his book Starlight and Time and in 1994. And uh, it's the, the reason why we're doing it in so much detail is because it has, um, it's become so popular. And um, um, a lot of uh, literature has been uh, dedicated to it, and um, so, and there's some good things about the this model. 
So we want to take a look at that. All right, uh, too often we think of space and time as separate entities, and this is something we want to clear up here. Modern physics, however, views them as parts of a whole, unified whole, called space-time. We've used that term already tonight with actually defining it. Um, space-time, if you remember, uh, you have you know, your x and your y axis, but you and I live in three-dimensional space, right? x, y, and we have the z component. We always forget the z component, right? But in space-time, we have a fourth, and that's time. Now, you and I, it's difficult to imagine a four-dimensional universe because all our axes have to be 90 degrees apart, right? Orthogonal. It's, it's called orth orthogonal. Well, time is orthogonal also. But you, we can't visualize that because we're trapped in this three-dimensional space. But mathematically, it works out very well. So to illustrate this kind of notion that space and time are all one unified whole. Let's take a look at the famous trampoline. Now, if you notice, the gal, she's on the trampoline. She's bending. And what happens is her mass causes the trampoline to bend or to warp. And the stiffness of the trampoline determines how much, how much bending is going to be permitted. OK, so this is the kind of model the kind of thinking that we want to think about as we establish our cosmogonies. <clears throat> so the existence of mass bends space-time. The Humphreys model was published in 1994 through Master Books. He presupposed that God created the universe through the means of a white hole. Now everybody knows what a black hole is, right? A black hole is where matter is so dense that the gravitational force is so incredibly strong that it pulls everything into it. From a general relativistic point of view, what's happening there is there's so much uh, matter that space is being bent, just like we saw in our little graphics uh, 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 earlier. Space is being bent into that piece of mass, and nothing can escape. So everything is going into this thing. And that's why it's black. There's no light, right? So they call it a black hole. The white hole is the exact opposite. It's shooting energy out as opposed to bringing it in like a black hole. So a white hole is shooting energy out, and it's through this idea that Russ uh, created his, um, or first articulated his model. The strength of his model is that he uses general relativity and he has a very strong commitment to what I call the normative reading of the biblical text. Okay, so I think there are two strengths of his model. The weaknesses are many of, uh, many of the experts in the field feel that uh, the wrong coordinate, systems, coordinate system was used and that the sign changes on his clocks was missed. Okay. Uh, these clocks in general relativity uh, is measuring time, but when the values go negative, they start reading space. Okay, they're called eigenvalues. So we have to be careful when that, th that occurs. We want to make sure that we understand what our clock is measuring. It's kind of an unusual concept. How in the world can a clock measure space? Okay, but these are some of the uh, weaknesses that uh, some of the experts have discussed. So based on Genesis 1, 1 through 3, the entire mass of the universe was in the form of a sphere of water, radius r if you will, within space-time. And that would be 1 through day 3. So the idea is that all the universe was an entire watery globe, okay, and all the mass of the universe was contained in that water. And so here we see, um, as God uh, began to separate the waters, he left some in the center to become the earth, right? That's the waters below, and he took the rest and separated them out, okay? So if you look, if you look at our graphic here, um, right here in the center would be the water 
that the earth is going to be made up of, and the ring, the spherical ring, if you will, that is being spread apart is this guy right here. So he's spreading it out, and sp he's spreading space out with it. So here's what it looks like um, uh, right here. Right here in the center would be the water for the earth. And as he's spreading out this watery ring, here we see it right here. Okay. Now, what's, what we want to make sure we understand is that notice that within this ring, what do you see? You see that the coordinate system, these little checkers, are all 90 degrees apart. So the space itself is relatively flat. What was the term we used for that before? It's relatively Euclidean. Okay. Now, if you get closer to this ring, notice what's happening. They're starting to bend. So they're becoming non-Euclidean, right? Okay. And this is what we see here in this graph right here. Let's go to the, the next. So let's take a look at some of the details, or the high-level details. So the radius of the waters and um, space-time are represented by this arrow here, and God is separating these guys out. Uh, gravity, of course, affects clock speed. And if we look, well, we're going to come to this in a second here. If we look, here we see right this this line right here this point right here is the ring of water if you will and as the ring of water is spread out the clocks start moving faster okay now there's a critical point right here notice if you're coming down the line the clocks are measuring things in a more, the clocks aren't ticking as fast, they're going slower and slower, till you come to this critical point where the clocks stop. Time is no longer being read. Time has come to a zero speed, if you will. Below that, there is no time, okay? So, what has happened here? <clears throat> If you remember, on the fourth day of creation, according to Russ's uh, model, the stars that were specifically created for signs and seasons are created on day four. Okay, That's adding mass to the system, right? So this extra mass would cause time to stop. In other words, what would happen if... If this mass is being introduced in, inside our little ring, okay, and, and as we come to the center, we get closer and closer to that critical point where time comes to a stop, then all our clocks are going to um, stop, right? So when God created those stars on day four, Russell's model requires that those clocks dip below that critical point. And the stops stop clicking, ticking. Okay, so <clears throat> this was uh, published in the Journal of Creation. And uh, its strength, of course, is, uh, is in using general relativity. And um, it, depends, it is dependent upon the stars being created on day four. Now, let me go back up to this particular graphic here on page 38. What is so important about this? Well, as the clock, as the mass is added, this line dips below this line here, this critical potential. Russ calls this the Acronis line. Time isn't there. Time no longer exists. Okay? As they are created and begin to expand out, this line begins to rebound. So as the, as the line begins to rebound, the light begins to rebound also. So the light starts from the earth out, and then when the line starts coming above the critical potential line, 
the light comes from the ring toward the earth. So it happens in a rebound kind of fashion. And that is Russ's model uh, where light can actually reach the earth in a very rapid way. Okay. So, like I had mentioned, this was uh, published in the Journal of Creation in 2007, 2008. Its strength is using general relativity. The question, however, is the mass from day four stars, uh, from the day four, four stars, separate from the universal waters? In other words, the stars that are mentioned on day four for signs and seasons, is that a separate creation of material stuff? Or, as we saw in the first session, is it just God forming matter as he's stretching out this water and using part of that water to create these stars? That's my position. Um, I, think, I think that actually is a better way of understanding what is going on on day four. But Russ's model requires that that be a separate creation. I, I don't agree with him on that. So is this achronicity a valid issue from a biblical point of view? In other words, can we actually state that on day four, time came to a stop? Is it necessary? Is the mathematical physics of his model correct? Are the correct coordinates used? And when do clocks read time or space? So these are some of the questions that people have on Russ's cosmology. It's kind of complex, but uh, if you go onto YouTube, you can see some of Russ's uh, lectures where he describes it in a very simple terms, and I would highly recommend doing that. Just go to YouTube and type in Russ Humphrey's cosmology, and you'll come up with several of them, uh, the latest one of which you may want to look at uh, from September of 2014 from the, I guess it's the Colorado Creation Group. Uh, he does a, a good job in explaining his model. Okay, uh, Russ's model has not been accepted generally uh, by the creation community. Uh, it still needs a lot of work. I would argue, however, that all of creation cosmology needs a lot of work. This is the most difficult area that we have yet to face. Uh, we lack personnel. There are very few people trained in general relativity, cosmology, differential geometry, and the mathematics needed to do this sort of work. So it's an area that we need help. As we'll see, I offer some suggestions of what we need to do. So let's take a look at the nature of space-time. And the reason why I want to look at this in this particular session is because we want to go away from here taking some elements that we need to know that has to go into our effort in developing a cosmology from a biblical creationist perspective. I don't think we've been successful yet. There's a lot of things we need to, to look at. On the macroscopic scale, what did we see when we looked at the biblical model? Well, we found that the, one of the things that the biblical text did was it described this idea of space-time as a scroll. Remember that? God stretches out heavens like a scroll. Okay, so on the macroscopic scale, we can view um, the heavens as like a um, a sheet where you can f you f you lay it out flat and you get rid of all the bumps and uh, you can have a nice view of space time. It can be stretched like a curtain. Now, has anyone ever hung a curtain here? Curtains don't stretch very far, do they? You basically get them out, and all you can do is get rid of the, the bumps and the folds. And um, so it's not like the universe that God is describing in Genesis and in else, elsewhere in the biblical text where you can stretch it like elastic. He's talking about folding it out and getting rid of the bumps, laying it out nice and flat. Space can be folded and bent like a sheet. Space expanded from a central area. Now, how, how, why can we conclude that? Well, if you're rolling out a scroll, let's say a, a, a two-folded, uh, two uh, two-sided scroll, excuse me, you, you roll that out from a central point. So it would, you could argue that there is some kind of a central 
aspect to a to the biblical model, right? So we might be able to use that that there's some kind of uh, there's a, a preferred location in space somewhere near the Earth. Space is bounded; it has an edge. A scroll has an edge; it's not an infinite sheet in all directions. On the microscopic scale, we want to view it as a scroll as well. Now, why is this important? Well, a scroll, depending on what it is, depending on the material, it can be made up of uh, fibers from plant material, right? Little, little fibers, maybe little cells. If you're talking about leather, leather is nothing but skin made up of little cells. So from a microscopic perspective, Space can be viewed, up, viewed as a collection of these little cells that are all kind of glued together. Just like a piece of leather, cells are all glued together. Okay, so what we saw in our biblical model is these kind of similes that are provided for us in Scripture help us to understand that we can use general relativity, which views space as this great continuum, like a sheet, and quantum mechanics views space in, this, in, the, in the finite, in the, little, in the little granule points of view. So we can view it as a, um, a sheet that's made up of a lot of little cells, a, little, a lot of little fibers. So from a creation point of view, we should be uh, traveling in the direction where we want to bring relativity and quantum mechanics together in our view of cosmogony and cosmology. Now we know every cosmologist is doing this, and this is something we should have seen a long time ago, long before anyone else did. And since uh, these things are finite, you don't have an infinite scroll, uh, I, I don't know of any scroll that you can fold out that's a Mobius strip, you know, um, its space is finite. So, space is created and therefore not absolute. Time also has an absolute beginning. It has a, dur uh, a duration. It is quantized. Now, if you remember, uh, how do we know that time is quantized? What biblical data can we bring to the topic of discussion that tells us that time is quantized? Well, when it, uh, when the, in 1 Corinthians 15, when it talks about that the rapture is going to take place in a moment of time, the Greek word there is atomos. And to the context, to the audience, they would understand an atom of that being something that cannot be further divided. Tomeo means to cut or to tear apart. And a tomeo means not to cut apart. You can't go any further. It's indivisible. Okay, so an atom is something that you can only go down to a certain level and that's it. And Paul used that term to describe the time that it's going to take uh, for this event that he calls the harpazo. And um, uh, he says that this rapture is going to take place even in a time smaller than this. God can do it, you and I can't. So time is quantized. It's viewed as an element that has a finite size to it, under which you can't go uh, beyond. So there exists a unit of time below which man cannot measure. Time is created and therefore not absolute. And the other interesting thing is that light in the biblical text seems to simply appear. Genesis does not tell us that light was created. It just appears. That's kind of the same thing in, um, in, uh, on day four with the lights, which means they weren't the same word that's used in Genesis 1-1 for create, bara, is not used in, on the fourth day. So that would be an argument where the stars created on day four were taken from the, the water that God is spreading out as he's creating these stellar objects. Okay. So light seems to appear. Now, a lot of people have difficulties with this light problem in Genesis 1 because light actually appears before the sun and the moon, and there seems to be a direction to that light because uh, it is being used to define a day, and the problem 
th that problem can be solved by correlating Genesis 1 with Psalm 8, where the Ancient of Days is being seen as being birthed when he's creating the universe. I think we took a look at that at one of the other sessions in a very small way. Matters created and therefore not absolute. In the early days of creation, uh, a lot of people felt that <clears throat> relativity was not legitimate because you could bend space and bend time. They were not absolute. And they had a problem with this idea of space and time not being absolute. They thought it led to some kind of moral relativism or something like that. But God is the only one who's absolute. Creation by its very nature cannot be absolute because it is created. Okay? So God is the only thing that's absolute. So we should not be afraid of the theory of relativity. It does not teach moral relativism. It has nothing to do with that. It's simply saying that, that um, the speeds that you and I observe depend upon our reference frame. That's all it says. <clears throat> okay. On the macroscopic scale, space and time seem to be viewed as a continuum. Thus, general relativity can be used to model the operation of space-time. On the microscopic scale, space-time uh, seem to be um, seems to be viewed as quantized elements, so that quantum mechanics can be used to model the operation of the space-time continuum which seems to imply the marriage of these two concepts, general relativity and quantum mechanics, marrying those two guys together and coming up with a biblical cosmology. Okay, where do we go from here? Uh, it's my opinion we have a lot of work to do in the area of cosmology. We have not come up with a successful model. And where do we go from here? First of all, I think we need to rigorously define the biblical creation or cosm uh, cosmological model. Uh, you know, we've only touched upon uh, the surface of all the data from the biblical text that go into establishing the characteristics and criteria for a biblical cosmological model. Okay, we need to do that in a rigorous way. That has not yet been done. We need to encourage young creation geeks <laughs> to go into physics, specifically relativity and cosmology. Okay, so it's one thing to go into physics and say, uh, electromagnetics but uh, or statistical physics but uh, general relativity and cosmology are separate branches of physics distinct branches of physics where you really need to master differential geometry and tensor analysis and all these advanced mathematics and other branches of mathematics does not necessarily require expertise in those areas of mathematics and until we do that, we're going to be slaves of the scholars, okay? So we really need to encourage our young people to take a rigorous view of the biblical text and go into these fields and try to establish and develop a biblical creation model, an empirical model. Uh, we should form a creation astroscience cosmology society, okay? And we should uh, create a journal devoted to the development of the creation model of cosmology and cosmogony. And uh, so I think these are some of the things that we need to do, especially number two, encourage young creation geeks to go into physics. I think this is real important for us to develop this model. We're just not enough people. We lack a database of people to, to do all this wonderful, wonderful work. So having said that, um, let's open it up uh, for questions.